Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Dear listeners, we bring a story of a man whose wife cheats on him with another man and is unapologetic till the end. It's a story of betrayal and revenge. It's a long story, but worth the time, so grab your snacks and buckle up. I was watching them on the dance floor. Linda and her partner moved seamlessly, their feet gliding together effortlessly. They looked well-suited, and my wife's face showed she was loving every moment. The room was filled with music, and other club members gathered around, clapping and enjoying the couple's performance. I had left my stool at the bar to peek into the large function room where the dance practice was taking place. Dancing was never my thing, but Linda was passionate about it, and when we joined the club, she was thrilled to discover the dance section. Sipping my drink, I observed Linda and her partner, George, engrossed in conversation about their performance. I felt a twinge of jealousy seeing their fingers intertwined as they chatted with other club members. I hadn't planned to meet her that evening. I just dropped into the club on my way home after finishing work early. George, a retired man in his early 60s, seemed confident and a bit of a ladies' man. Linda had mentioned him several times, emphasizing how good of a dancer he was and how sought after he was by the ladies in the group. I had zoned out after hearing about him repeatedly, but here I was, checking him out. We've been married for 20 years, with two teenage children leading independent lives. We joined the local social club to broaden our social circle, but lately, Linda's focus on dancing had intensified. The dance evenings and practices had increased from once a fortnight to weekly, with the occasional extra practice night. As I sat at the table in the corner, unnoticed by the group, I couldn't help but feel uneasy. Linda and George looked so natural and casual together, and it worried me. My blood started to boil, and I braced myself to intervene when the group dispersed. However, when the music started again, Linda emerged with a new partner. I sat back, scanning the pairings, and realized that all the men were in their 60s, while most of the women were much younger. No wonder they were all smiling. I sat in the bar, watching Linda dance with that guy. He held her close, hand firmly on her lower back. They chatted amicably, and Linda looked flushed at times. I decided I had seen enough and slipped away back to the bar. Their session would end soon, and I planned to wait for her casually. At the bar, I got another drink and sat by the fruit machines, blending into the busy crowd. As the dancers exited the function room and mingled around the bar, I waited for Linda, but she didn't appear. After five minutes, I squeezed through the crowd and peered into the empty function room. No sign of anyone. Perplexed, I scanned the bar again, but she was nowhere to be found. I stepped outside into the cool evening air, looking across the car park, but there was no sign of Linda or anyone else. I tried to convince myself she got a lift home, but something felt off. Walking to my car, my mind filled with mistrust, imagining scenarios without any real evidence. I started the car and headed home. Arriving home just after 9.30 p.m., I hit the garage door remote and slid my car inside. Linda's car was in its usual spot, and I reasoned she might have gotten a lift to the club. I went upstairs to check the house. The clock showed 9.55 p.m., and the house felt empty. Stripping out of my clothes, I got in the shower, trying to make sense of the situation. Wide awake and refreshed, I toweled myself down and dressed again. It was 10.30 p.m., and Linda still hadn't returned. Concerns grew, and I wondered who she was with. Pacing the floor by 11.05 p.m., I felt a mix of worry, anger, and confusion. Something was not right. I worked late shifts every three weeks, providing opportunities for her to step out during those nights. However, nothing had changed in our intimate life. By 11.27 p.m., I decided I needed answers. I looked at the clock and realized Linda wouldn't expect me home for another hour. I ran upstairs, cleaned the shower, and grabbed my dirty clothes. Slipping out the back door and into the garage, I waited in the dark. At 11.38 p.m., I debated whether to hide in the garage or leave in my car. By 11.58 p.m., I heard a car outside. My heart pounded as the front door opened and closed. Relief washed over me momentarily. I sat waiting until 12.18 a.m. before taking deep breaths and exiting the garage. The back door was unlocked, and I stepped into the kitchen, calling out that it's only me. I heard a voice answer from upstairs, Hi love, you okay? Drying my hair, I dumped my dirty washing in the machine and noticed Linda's underwear. Curiosity got the better of me, and I fished out the bra and panties. She bought just recently I had to look so I felt her panties they were soaked lifting them to my nose I could smell her scent and the very strong scent of something that does not belong to my wife. The evidence was stacking up, but I needed irrefutable proof. I was determined to show undeniable proof, 
wanting both the moral high ground and concrete evidence before seeking retribution. Retaliation would come later, but for now, I needed to expose the truth beyond any doubt. Suddenly, thoughts of our kids crossed my mind. I hadn't considered their whereabouts before, and it was Wednesday. Neither had called from college, so they were probably staying over at friends' places. That's what I told myself, at least. I trudged upstairs toward our bedroom, my heart heavy yet pounding like a steam hammer. Walking into the unknown, or, perhaps, an uncertain future, a confrontation loomed, but I needed to gather more information first. In our bedroom, I found Linda sitting in front of her dressing table, drying her hair. She turned, smiling at me, and I asked her about her evening. Oh, it was okay. I went to dance as usual. Brian picked me up. Have you met him at the club? She inquired, smiling again. I feigned ignorance, and she continued. No, I don't think I have had the pleasure. Does he dance too? Yes, he does. He brings his wife along too. He gave me a lift tonight too, she explained, gauging my reaction. I inquired about her recent shower, and she confirmed, but something felt off. I kissed her on the cheek, pretending everything was normal. I mentioned my tiredness and jumped into bed, all while watching her in the mirror. Linda slipped into bed after a few more minutes, and I lay back, observing her nervous actions. A battle of wills ensued, neither of us wanting to be the first to break the silence. Inwardly, I was in turmoil, barely holding myself together. Eventually, she whispered a good night, and I decided to wait for the right moment to unveil my discovery. I woke up early to find Linda already up, the smell of fresh coffee wafting from the kitchen. I followed the sin after a quick shower and dressed. She sat at the table, reading the newspaper. Despite my cautiousness, I put on a happy face and greeted her. As I poured coffee, I watched her closely, trying to discern her thoughts. How was dancing last night? I asked, but she kept her eyes on the paper, claiming it was the same as usual. I smiled, masking my inner turmoil. After mentioning a trip to Blackpool, I probed further, asking if it was for couples or just dance partners. She seemed to stiffen briefly but said it could be as few as four couples and places were limited. So, as she mentioned the limited spots for the dance trip to Blackpool, I considered the implications. She looked at me over the rims of her glasses, waiting for my response. I held her gaze, contemplating the situation. We had gone away separately on weekends before, so there was no reason to object, but this time, I had something to worry about. Playing it cool, I put on my best poker face and said, I am sure it will be a really special weekend, and I know you have always wanted to go there, so why not go for it? To my surprise, she leaped from her seat, grabbed my face, and planted a passionate kiss on my lips. Oh, Rick, thank you. It means so much to me. I won't forget this. When I get back, I will make it up to you. Thank you, she gushed. I managed to pry myself free from her grasp, trying to fathom the sudden onrush of affection. Allowing myself a smug smile, I patted her on the ass as I got up to leave. I won't be long, love. I need to drop by Alfie's. See you around lunchtime, I said. Helen was still smiling as I left, and so was I. I had navigated through that without getting angry or tipping my hand. I was rather proud of myself. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had crossed a line, almost becoming a spy on my own wife. I now suspected her of doing something behind my back, and I wondered in what state our marriage truly was, if it still existed at all. Driving to my friend Alfie's place, I pondered the situation. We had known each other since school, played golf together, and shared tales of teenage angst. It was normal for us to hang out, and it wouldn't raise suspicions. Alfie was married with kids, creating a comfortable and lived-in home. I sat at the breakfast bar, brewed some coffee, and waited for Alfie. When he finally joined me, he could tell something was on my mind. I hesitated but eventually shared my suspicions about Helen's infidelity. Alfie was shocked, thinking I must be mistaken. I sat silently as he absorbed the revelation, and then he offered his support. Alfie put his hand on my shoulder, assuring me that we could deal with this. I hadn't confronted Helen yet, and he could tell this was serious. I recounted what I knew, and as I finished, I felt a mixture of relief and distress. Alfie asked, What are you going to do, Rick? Confront her, or what? I replied that I would confront her, but needed to know the extent of the situation. I mentioned a hints about a trip to Blackpool, suspecting it might be a cover for something more. Alfie and I looked out at the apple trees we had planted in memory of his mom, a woman who had been like a second mother to me. Alfie asked what we were going to do. I admitted that I needed more information about the guys in the dance section, particularly George and Brian. 
He raised logical questions about whether these men were married or if their partners knew. It was something I hadn't considered, but it opened up possibilities for retribution. I expressed my need for information on these guys and the other club members. Despite their seeming tight-knit group, I had to keep it together until I knew more. Alfie assured me that he would ask around discreetly, warning the women to be cautious not to spook them. As we discussed potential plans for revenge, some outlandish, some cathartic, I looked at the clock. It was after 1 p.m., and Helen might be wondering where I was. There were no calls to my phone, and I left Alfie's place with a promise to speak again soon, hoping for news or progress. Driving slowly back towards home, my mind was weighed down with thoughts of my wife. I had believed we were okay, maybe even happy, and I never saw this betrayal coming. Now, with the veil lifted, I could recall missed opportunities and small signs that hindsight revealed. It was frustrating to think that I had blindly waved her off every week without considering potential trouble. How stupid and trusting had I been? Pulling into my driveway, I noticed the garage door was up and Helen's car wasn't there. I entered an empty house, grateful that our kids were away, giving me time to gather my thoughts and maybe find some clues. I checked emails, drawers, and closets, but found nothing. Frustration set in, and I decided to resort to a phone tracker. I downloaded the software planning to set it up on both our phones. The next challenge was getting access to Helen's phone, where potential evidence might be hidden. I needed to check for messages and texts. The Play Store provided a solution, and I downloaded the tracker onto my phone, intending to do the same on Helen's when the opportunity arose. Around 2 p.m., I heard Helen's car pull into the driveway. As she entered, her eyes met mine, and I detected a moment of nervousness or fear. I smiled, offering to pour coffee. We sat at the breakfast bar, sipping coffee, as I carefully broached the subject of a fishing trip with my friend Alfie. Her face betrayed a slight unease, and she explained that there were no places left on the trip. I sensed something was amiss. Later, when she mentioned feeling a little grubby and headed for a shower, I seized the chance to grab her phone. In 10 minutes, I had the tracking software loaded, checked her messages, and took note of contacts. I discovered messages to a few people, one of them being a member from the club. The next few days were tense, filled with questions and suspicions. As the trip approached, my unease grew. I declined any sexual contact with Helen, which surprisingly went unnoticed. She was excited about the upcoming weekend, but details about her club activities remained elusive. I kept my eyes and ears open, waiting for any clues. Alfie's wife stumbled upon a key detail while chatting with Brian's wife, a copy of the hotel reservation for two rooms. It seemed like it was just the four of them going making the situation even more intimate. On Thursday, I headed over to Alfie's to discuss the plan. Patty poured us drinks, and as I shared my desire for revenge, Alfie and Patty supported me. The anger and pain overwhelmed me, leading to the first time I broke down since discovering the affair. Patty's comforting arms around my neck reminded me of the emotional void in my life. Despite my best efforts to hold it together, the ache in my chest persisted. Tomorrow, waving her off would be tough, knowing what she had planned for the weekend. Our marriage was shattered beyond repair, and I was determined to move her stuff out and have it ready at her parents' place by the time she left on Friday. Friday came, and I left work early as Helen prepared to leave by 4 p.m. Brian and his wife were driving up, and Helen was taking her car to join them. Although the details about the others weren't clear, I already knew she was meeting him. I helped load her suitcases into the car, and despite her apparent excitement, I sensed distraction in her eyes. As I gave her my best actor's smile, she searched my eyes, questioning if I was okay with her going. Her guilt might have surfaced briefly, but then her phone rang, interrupting the moment. She had to run, and she kissed me passionately, a type of kiss we hadn't shared in ages. She slid into the driver's seat, flashed a smile, and drove off. Waving goodbye with a wet face, I turned to the garage, revealing the cartons I had prepared. In less than an hour, I had packed and stacked all her belongings, ready to be collected. The reality of our shattered marriage loomed heavily in the quiet of the house, and I braced myself for the challenging days ahead. I sat down, breathing heavily, when the house phone rang. It was Alfie checking in on me. All bagged and tagged here, mate. Just taking a breather is all, I replied. Alfie advised me to take it easy on the drinks, emphasizing the need to build alibis. We agreed that he would pick me up the next morning, and I confirmed that I'd be ready. Now that I had started packing, I needed to keep busy. I decided to pop over to her parents' place later to show my face and create a story. I checked the phone locator. She did go to that home address, 
which was something we could take care of quickly. Alfie assured me he would see me in the morning. Sitting in the quiet house, feeling the emptiness, I watched the clock slowly tick round. It was almost 6 p.m., she had been gone for almost two hours. Checking the locator, I saw she was still at the address not more than three miles away, maybe spending some time with him before they traveled. My heart ached painfully. She had no idea what she had done to me. I threw a glass across the room, smashing against the wedding photo on the mantel. Standing amidst the remnants of the glass and my shattered marriage, I strode out the door to my car. I drove to Helen's parents' place. It was almost 7.30 p.m. when I got there. They were happy to see me but asked where she was. I told them about the trip to Blackpool and her dad mentioned a dozen or so boxes of stuff Helen asked him to drop off. They appreciated my thoughtfulness and I left for home, somewhat sadder. Deciding I couldn't face them after tomorrow, I planned to write a letter to explain things. The next morning, I woke with a heavy heart and a pounding head. I hadn't slept well, haunted by visions of what my wife might be doing with George in their room. I expected pictures from the investigator I hired. Checking my emails, there it was, a message with an attachment. A series of a dozen photos showed Helen in the arms of George, enjoying themselves in a bar, walking back to the hotel, sharing a kiss outside their room. Another couple was with them. The last photo showed them entering their rooms. It was enough for me. We were done. Alfie arrived, and we loaded the boxes into his truck. By lunchtime, we had dropped everything off and sat back in my kitchen, drinking coffee. Alfie suggested popping into the club to show our faces and spread our alibi. We loaded fishing gear onto Alfie's truck and drove to the club, chatting with members about fishing until we were bored. We made sure Alfie's truck was spotted on CCTV with the rods on the roof. Job done. We left just after 2 p.m., dropping by my house and picking up my car before driving to a lake a few miles away, making sure the owners knew we were there. Buying our date stamp tickets before driving around, we found a quiet spot by a tranquil lake. The routine we followed was well-practiced. Rods and bivy set up, creating the appearance of a comfortable camp. Rods and bait were out, and we sat back, waiting. At 7 p.m., a truck pulled in behind us, and Gas stumbled towards us. Gas, an old friend from almost infant school, was part of the small circle of guys I trusted without question. After grabbing a can, cracking it open, and taking a deep swig, he sat in one of our chairs. Good man, how you doing, Gas? Alfie asked. Gas, with a bear-like presence, replied, good, mate. So, you off then, or what? After checking our fishing setup, he hugged me in a big man hug, offering words of encouragement and understanding. Gas knew my pain, having experienced a similar situation a couple of years ago. His wife had left him, and he didn't take it well, resulting in some confrontation. He reassured me, hang in there, man. Get it done, and then we can have some fun tomorrow. With Gas off on his own mission of revenge, we were soon cruising down the motorway toward Blackpool. As Alfie drove, I called the private investigator for the latest update. He had more pictures and some video, having sweet-talked the hotel owner into letting him inside the room. The footage left no doubt about the group's activities, an afternoon of sex and partner swapping. He confirmed that he had both photos and videos, and I asked him to send them to me in the morning. Alfie could see the emotions on my face as we listened to the investigator on the hand-free kit. He reached out, squeezing my shoulder, providing silent support. After the call, I questioned, Why, Alfie? Why is she doing this? Alfie replied, CK knows why, mate, but it is what it is. We know what needs to be done. So let's get to it. Stay focused. We arrived in Blackpool around 11.30 p.m. and slowly made our way to the hotel. With the registration numbers and makes of their cars, we parked 100 yards away and walked back. Their cars were parked next to each other in a quiet corner. Wearing surgical gloves, dark glasses, and balaclavas, we hopped over the back wall enclosing the parking area and approached the cars. Brian's car was the first target. The four valve stems were cut, the fuel cap opened, and a mixture of sand and sugar was poured into the tank. George's car received similar treatment, with decorative scratches added to the paint job. Satisfied with our mischief, we giggled like school kids as we hurried back over the wall. The drive back south was uneventful, and a strange release of tension washed over me. I felt a sense of taking control back over my life. Outside George's house, I hopped into my wife's car with the spare keys, quietly pulling it off the driveway. Deciding not to leave Helen's car out of the fun, we parked in a quiet lane for some modifications. A sledgehammer took care of the windscreen and sunroof, and windows were smashed. 
A spray can added an artistic touch, an outline of a naked woman with a mobile phone number. We drove Helen's modified car back to George's drive, parked it, and then eased Alfie's truck away from the scene. Returning to the lake, we found Gas asleep with empty cans around him. All the rods were pulled in and locked off. As we snuck into the bivy for some shut-eye, Alfie giggled and Gas moaned. All okay, he mumbled, and we settled in for some much-needed sleep. On Sunday morning, we woke to a heavy dew and the smell of eggs and bacon cooking. Patty had prepared breakfast, hauling camping equipment and breakfast items with her. The owner and his wife were expected shortly, and she explained that she had asked them to pop by. Patty believed we couldn't have too many friends at a time like this. Smiling, I crept from the sleeping bag, ready to face whatever came next. She was an angel and clever as hell. How did you end up with such a woman, Alfie? I asked. Hell if I know, mate. I was never consulted. Just seemed to happen one day, Alfie replied. Despite losing my wife, I still had some great mates. The owner of the lake strolled by with his wife, and we enjoyed hot coffee and bacon sandwiches. A group photo was taken with the lake in the background and two double-figure carp in front, courtesy of gas. We sat back, enjoying the warm late summer sun. Around 11 a.m., someone's mobile phone chirped, and we anticipated the inevitable calls. Alfie, looking at his wife, said, here it comes. We both resumed childlike giggling as the ringing and messages continued for the next 10 minutes. The laughter escalated as we imagined the frustration of the attempts to move their cars with sabotage tires. After the silence of almost three hours, we assumed their cars were being sorted out and they were on their way back. The locator on Helen's phone confirmed their departure from Blackpool. I thought, well, it was fun while it lasted. The next call was from Helena, and she must have arrived at George's place. The messages and texts poured in, but I ignored all of them. I wanted her to be confused and feel the guilt I had been experiencing. I found myself getting angrier, but Alfie reassured me to stay cool, letting her stew as we had planned. The tracker showed that she had gone home, and the call started again, leading to more giggling as we sipped JDs and listened to the phone. Helen's eventful day included her lover's cars being trashed, leaving her stranded 100 miles from home. As she managed to get a ride back home, she discovered her car had also been trashed, triggering another set of calls. She found her keys didn't work at her previous address, marking the third set of calls. By 9 p.m., the call stopped, and we all looked at each other, waiting for her next move. Patty, with a grin, suggested I stay at their place, blocking any impulsive actions. I agreed to stay until tomorrow, deciding what to do next, considering work and Helen's reactions. Around 11.30 p.m., the call stopped, and I checked the tracker to find Helen back at George's place. I realized I had miscalculated her move, expecting her to be at her parents' place. Clearly, she hadn't called them yet, aiming to keep things quiet. We wondered how long she could keep up that charade. Patty's concern was evident, and I appreciated her genuine worry for my well-being. As the morning sun streamed through the curtains, casting a bittersweet glow in the room, I realized that today was the day of reckoning. The exhaustion from the emotional roller coaster of the weekend clung to me, but a strange sense of determination also fueled my thoughts. Patty's hearty breakfast provided a momentary distraction, and I wolfed it down, trying to gather the strength needed for the difficult conversations ahead. The looming confrontation with Helen, coupled with the uncertainty of the future, weighed heavily on my mind. Alfie's suggestion to check out my place made sense. I needed to face the reality of my home, the place where betrayal had unfolded. Yet, I anticipated that Helen would eventually show up, and the thought of that encounter churned my stomach. Patty's words echoed in my mind, urging me to think carefully about my next steps. Was there really no way back? Could our marriage withstand the storm of infidelity and broken trust? These questions lingered, but deep down, I knew the answers were elusive. I spoke to Patty, acknowledging her concern and expressing gratitude for the unwavering support from both her and Alfie. The decision weighed heavily on me, and as I contemplated the path ahead, I couldn't shake the feeling that today marked the irreversible turning point in my life. The morning unfolded, the clock ticking relentlessly, pushing me closer to the inevitable confrontation. I wondered how long Helen could keep her secrets from her parents and how the truth would unravel in the coming hours. The uncertainty of it all added to the heaviness in the room, creating an atmosphere charged with emotion and anticipation. Today is the day. Maybe I will check out my place but I expect her to show up at some point. I can't avoid her forever, can I? But it won't be until she comes clean with her parents first, and she will tell them, believe me, or I will, with nothing held back. 
Are you sure this is what you want, Rick? I mean, is there no way back? Whatever you want to do, you know Alfie and me are behind you all the way. But please think about it before you go so far that there is no turning back. Patty, I have had time to think about what she has been doing. My PI has sent me photos, and I am waiting for video evidence this morning. I know what she has done. I don't know why though, that's the thing. What is it I have done to cause this? I felt my emotions getting out of control again, and my eyes were misting up as the ache in my chest built, thinking of her with those a-holes. I made a plan to screw up their weekend. I know it was childish, but better than ending up in jail for MDR, although I still feel like doing them all in. Patty hugged me tightly. I needed that so much right then too. I was on the edge. I needed to stay calm and strong, but today was going to be difficult. I wanted nothing more than to strangle the bitch and chop up her lovers into small pieces and feed them to the pigs. I was angry. Yes, maybe today was to be the day. I turned my phone on and sat in Alfie's home office as I hooked up my laptop to the Wi-Fi. I heard Alfie chatting to Patty as I opened my mail account. Alfie put his head around the door. You okay? Rick? He looked over my shoulder and saw what I was doing. You sure you want to see what's in there, mate? I nodded to him grimly as I opened the message. The PI's message gave a brief report and indicated a more detailed report was attached along with a zip file with photos and video. I started to sob as my heart pounded. I was engulfed in a whirlwind of emotions as I sat there, Alfie's hand still on my shoulder. Clicking on the photos, the slideshow unfolded, starting with Helen and George outside the hotel, then shifting to Brian and his wife in the bar. They all seemed comfortable until there was a change of partners, with hugs and kisses as they danced. The group appeared at ease with each other. The pictures continued until shots from inside one of the rooms emerged. My stomach churned, feeling queasy as I watched my marriage unravel through the progression of photos. Behind me, Patty had followed Alfie into the small room. I turned, her hand over her mouth, tears streaming down her face. In seconds, we were all sharing tears and a group hug as I sobbed at the end of my marriage. Alfie turned the slideshow off. I am so sorry, Rick. So, so sorry. What the nonsense is she thinking? And with those two nonsense ears? I couldn't answer him as I gasped for breath and tried to regain some control. My heart felt like a huge lump of stone in my chest. I felt dizzy, frozen in my heartbreak. This settles it, as far as I am concerned. I am not having that be asterisk 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 back. No nonsense way. I am going to ruin her nonsense life as far as I can. My friends saw my sadness morph into a white-hot anger, and they feared for me. So did I but I didn't give a underscore underscore for the consequences now. My phone's ring on broke the moment, its loud cheerful tones signifying it was Helen. I didn't hesitate. I grabbed it and pressed answer. Yes, I said brusquely. Oh, thank God, Rick. Are you okay? I got back last night, and someone has trashed my car. So I got a cab home, but then the lock on the front door seemed to have jammed. I couldn't get indoors, and I tried ringing you but didn't get through. Are you still fishing or something? What is happening? Yes, something has happened. I answered without emotion. Rick, come on. What's going on? Are you home now or on your way? I need to get in and change or I will have to call work and take a day off. Yes, Helen, you might want to do that. I won't be home till later. I haven't decided yet. I let the words hang in the air. She was silent for a few seconds. Rick, is there something wrong? You seem a little strange her voice rising as she was starting to get a little frustrated with my cryptic comments. I think she was also beginning to sense something was very wrong after all that had happened in the past day or so. She was slowly starting to join the dots together. Maybe I can help you like always, she posed tentatively. I will let you know when I have made a decision, I said, ending the call. I felt like ice. I don't know how I managed to stop myself from screaming at her, but my sadness was hanging on to me like an anchor, keeping me steady. As I put my phone down, it rang again. I ignored it before turning the ringer off. It sat on the desk, vibrating and flashing with each new call. Not once did she mention what was done to her car, that George's car had been vandalized. Both things I would have thought merited some mention as being out of the ordinary. I am sure she was trying to keep a lid on the chaos at her end until she was sure what was going on. Now she knew something was afoot. George must have realized that it was no coincidence. Had they discussed it? Were they making plans to limit the damage or move on together? My heart ached at the thought of it, but my anger was fueled by the realization that they had spent the night together again. I needed to get control and not just react to events. I used the house phone and called a solicitor, arranging a meeting to discuss divorce for the next day. 
I also called work and arranged a week off. I knew Helen would be taking the day off, so she would be looking to track me down. It was only a matter of time before she arrived here. After making a few more calls, I went back to my laptop and dealt with the emails I needed to send. I had decided to send a copy of the slideshow to the committee of the club and as many of the members as I could. I had a group address I used when dealing with some fundraising on their behalf, so I was sure at least a couple of hundred members would have a surprise when they opened their mail accounts. I then went after Helen's work colleagues. I knew there were a few people there who would enjoy seeing what she got up to after hours. Nonsense. They are going to know I am cuckled soon enough anyway. Then so be it. At least this way, there won't be the slow humiliation by rumor, innuendo, and whispers. I want it out there. And then people would be more interested in what a jerk Helen was rather than my situation as the hapless cuckold, I thought. I grabbed a coffee from Patty as I came out of the home office. She looked at me concerned. For better or for worse, I have started the ball rolling. I can't undo it, but I can make it happen, I said. Alfie and Patty looked at each other anxiously. You know she is probably on her way right now, Alfie said. Yes, I know. So I reckon I have about 20 minutes to get on my way. I am going to dodge her for a day or so until she starts to get some feedback from the messages I have sent. I fully expect that to start any time now, really. I haven't told her parents, though. I want her to do that, I explained. I looked at my watch. Have to run. I gulped my coffee and hugged both my friends before grabbing my car keys and heading out the door. We will act dumb, Rick, as far as she is concerned. We went fishing. It won't hold water for long, but it will buy you time. I drove quickly away and headed for the motorway. I just needed to get away while everything hit the fan. I rolled onto the 25 and headed west. That would do for now. My phone continued to vibrate. So far today, I reckon I had about a dozen missed calls. I pulled into the services at South Moose and decided to check my list of calls to see where my wife was. The tracker showed she was at Alfie's. I smiled as I imagined the reception she was getting, and they would hold on to the fishing story, driving Helen nuts with it. I was sure she would be a little perplexed and confused until she started getting messages from her friends at work. I chuckled to myself, playing this game, but it wasn't a game, it was my life, and it was deadly serious. I knew Helen had left Alfie's by now and watched as she headed back towards George's place. The nonsense woman couldn't stay away from that guy. Well, I was sure I wouldn't have to wait long. It was 12.30, so my emails would have hit the deck, and the responses should be coming very soon. A text from Helen arrived. Oh dear me, looks like it has started. Nonsense. I chuckled again as I sat in my car. I decided to call Alfie. Alfie, it's Rick. How did it go? EFF man. She's going crazy. We stuck to the fishing tail. Patty nearly lost it a couple of times, though. She wanted to batter the bish, especially when she said she had a nice time in Blackpool and couldn't understand what was wrong with you. I laughed. She is obviously trying to bluff it out. No mention of her car, I suppose. Did she say what she did last night or where she stayed? Oh yeah, she stayed at her parents' place, like we didn't already know. I think you're right about her bluffing. No mention of her motor. She turned up here in a cab. She had him wait outside. Just hang in there. Okay? Yeah, we'll do. Thanks. You two have been great. By the way, her bluff isn't going to hold for long. I reckon any minute now, her friends and work colleagues will be calling her. I'm going to lay low until tomorrow when I go to see my solicitor. I'll call you then. Cheers, mate. Love to Patty. I headed around the M25 and turned off towards Heathrow, finding a small hotel that would do for a night or two. I grabbed my hold all which I had packed ahead of time, from the boot of the car and booked in. The room was basic but comfortable. The quiet was overpowering, though. I laid out my laptop and phone, plugged in the chargers, and meandered around to the pub next door. It was after 3 p.m. now, and breakfast was a long time back. I picked up the menu at the bar and ordered a beer and a T-bone, sliding into a corner booth. I sipped my beer. It tasted sharp and went down easy. I was looking out the window at the green fields and picnic tables when the waitress brought my steak over. She smiled at me and sashayed away. I looked at her. She was pretty, I suppose, but her figure, although curvy, didn't register with me at all. I felt sort of dead inside, numb, like nothing mattered. I munched slowly through the steak. It was good but not like the ones Helen did at home. Another knife in my heart as I started to think of all the things I would miss about her. She had been a really wonderful wife, gorgeous looking flirty, sexy, everything a man would want. Over the past year or so, I suppose things had settled down. 
Maybe work had been on the up for us both. With more and more of our time taken up in climbing the greasy pole, financially we were fine. We had our own bank accounts and credit cards, and money wasn't short, so we were comfortable. Our sex life had taken a hit now that I think about it. Things had been quiet for some months, and maybe I didn't realize we were growing apart. We both had our hobbies. I had my fishing, which used to be obsessive but now was more relaxed and sociable. Helen had her dancing, keep fit, and the odd bridge night. I realized then that we were indeed spending more time apart than before. The keep fit was the thing that spurred her to start dancing again. She had been going with, what's her name, Brian's wife. The gym was the beginning, and then the dancing in carts. When had she started to play bridge for nonsense's sake? What was I, nonsense, blind? I clenched my fist and banged the table, rocking my beer. There were a few odd looks from other customers in the bar. I blushed and calmed down, my mind working through what I now believe to be the start of my problem with Helen. I sank another couple of beers before making my way back to my room. I sat on the bed as I waited for the kettle to boil. I needed a coffee. So, as far as I could work out, it was Brian and his wife who were the instigators of my wife's affair. They were swingers. Well, it made sense. That was why they swapped partners with George. But he had no partner, so he used my wife in his swaps. I appeared to know who, but had no idea as to why. I looked at my phone. It was still flashing away with a host of messages and texts received. Okay, it was time I took a look. The messages started yesterday. Obviously, all were from Helen. That is until late afternoon when there was one from a number I recognized at George's. I know I can't prove it, but I am sure it was you that screwed with my car. I won't forget this seems like you know I have been effing Helen for the past few months. While she is good in bed and she does love it when we both do her. Yes, me and Brian have both had her several times too. She is a good piece of meat and I love how she gets screams my name when she climaxes and you know what I'm going to enjoy effing her even more from now on. You do whatever you got to do, man. I don't give an F. She is in the shower right now. We will be getting back to it in a few minutes, I am sure. See you, sucker. I saved the message. I was really pissed now, and this guy was well worth the jail time. Nonsense it. He had obviously left the message without Helen knowing, I reasoned. I grinned as I thought of the damage I did to his car. Petty for sure, but a start. I looked at the rest of the messages. Nearly all from Helen, some after she found the door locked and more since we spoke this morning. There were a few others I didn't recognize. Turns out there were two from committee members at the club, and a shitstorm was brewing there at the members' behavior. I was advised that those concerned would be summarily thrown out of the club. That was satisfying as a start. I thought again, then another couple from two of Helen's friends at work asking if it was a hoax, as they could not believe what they were seeing. Shocked, definitely. Disgusted, most certainly. I tapped out a follow-up message to all, stating that Helen had gotten involved with a swinger group without my knowledge, and was enjoying new partners outside of our marriage. I also added that I was not prepared to agree or put up with this behavior, and that from now on, we were not together. I didn't listen to any of Helen's messages and checked my email. There was a long list of replies to my earlier messages, mostly expressing shock and disbelief at this turn of events. I forwarded all the responses to Helen's email account so she would see how people were reacting to her betrayal. Petty, yes, of course but I wanted her to understand how many of her friends and colleagues knew what she was doing and how they felt about it too. I closed my laptop and crawled onto the bed. My coffee was a warm comfort before I tried to sleep. Tears filled my eyes as I recalled my life with the woman I loved and now had obviously lost. Her betrayal was all-consuming, clouding my thinking, making my heart ache. I felt anxious all the time. Adrenaline was coursing through me, making sleep difficult, as I wanted to pummel the bastards who had done this to us. Then I realized it was her. She had done this to us. At that moment, I wanted to kick the bish. I was so angry. I drifted into sleep and surprisingly slept until almost 8 a.m. That's almost nine hours. Really good for me. I showered and shaved, looking at myself in the mirror. I looked as if I had aged 10 years since Friday. I stared into my eyes and saw a determined, icy look, yet my face gave away my sadness too. Nonsense it. Today, we are going to deal with this effing nonsense, the lot of them. I dressed and took breakfast at the pub. In an hour, I was checked out and, on my way, back home, my mind working so fast, yet calm and sort of blank at the same time. An icy calm was wrapped over me like a protective shield. I would need it today. I met with my solicitor, who listened to my case and started on the necessary paperwork straight away. 
I was not in the mood to listen to any talk of counseling or reconciliation and shut him down, so he soon got the message. He informed me he would call me when everything was ready. I told him I wanted to sue for adultery and named the two bastards as correspondents. I didn't give EFF how difficult it made things. As far as I was concerned, my marriage was over, and if things worked out, the guilty parties would pay all the costs. I would have my day in court too, nonsense them all. With that done, I headed home. I pulled up outside my home and sat looking at the house. Less than a week ago, I shared this with my wife. Now I knew her only as a stranger, and she would never set foot in there again. I was thinking of putting it on the market before I thought, no nonsense, I am keeping it. I went inside and looked around. It felt empty, it sounded empty too. My phone vibrated in my pocket. I looked at it strangely, and it was Helen. This was the first call today, it was almost twelve. Maybe she had been otherwise engaged with Georgie Boy. I chuckled grimly at the thought that while I was suffering, those two were nonsense like rabbits without a care in the world. I sat in my recliner and got comfortable before I answered the call. Yes, you base, what the EFF have you done? I am getting calls from everyone about some photos and a video apparently showing something to do with me and George. You nonsense base, why didn't you talk to me first? My work colleagues have been calling, giving me grief. My friends have done the same. Even the club has basically told me I am not welcome. Why, Rick? Listen, you effing piece of crap. I know. Get it? I effing know everything. I know who, where, and when. I have pictures of all four of your effing. I even have the video. All I need now is the effing t-shirt. Talk to you? What the nonsense for? What about? So you can tell me how you are effing other guys, and I am supposed to be fine with it? Never gonna happen. Effing, do you get the effing message yet? We need to talk, Rick. Let me explain, please. This has to stop. Stop? You effing bitch. I have only just started. What do you mean? She asked, her voice trembling a little now. You and your nonsense buddies have pissed me off. Now you can all just EFF off quietly, or I will make you understand. Don't be silly, Rick. You are just annoyed and overreacting. We need to talk, please, overreacting. Listen, you nonsense to it. I have started divorce proceedings. Want me to repeat that for you? I am naming your nonsense, but is in my petition, and I don't give a nonsense how nonsense much trouble it causes me. You are them. But I will have my way. Fight me on this, and you will get precisely nonsense all. You understand me? We are done. Over. Finito. Divorce. What? Why? But we, it was just, you can't, Rick. You can't just throw me away like that. Yes, I effing can, you bitch. And it is you who has thrown our marriage away, not me. I am just ending this farce. You can't be serious, Rick. Please, stop, and think about this. Where will I go? My friends, they all know. They are calling and saying things. The people I work with too. My boss even knows. Everyone knows because you effing told them, you base. Stop this, Rick. Stop it. Helen, not everyone knows, though, do they? What? Who doesn't know then? The realization hit her. Oh my god, you haven't told my parents. Please, tell me you didn't. Though I haven't told them. I thought I would leave it for you to do. Would be so much better coming from you, don't you think? Tell them how their ever-loving daughter has been nonsense around with a couple of swingers and is now the toast of the town. I am sure they will be so proud of you, don't you think, sweetie? I will give you one hour from now to tell them before I do it for you, pictures and video, all of it. Do you understand me, bish? There is silence, save the quiet sobbing over the phone. One last thing, Helen. I know you have been staying with George. I hope you two will be very happy together. I am sure he has plenty of friends that he will want to share you with so you won't run out of fresh meat anytime soon. Did you know he kindly left me a message yesterday? Obviously when you got back from your nonsense EFF fest, he said he was going to be effing you from now on. Tell him thanks for that. I have passed that on to my solicitor too. You effing hurt me, you bitch. So EFF off and do whatever you and George do best. I don't want to speak to you anymore. Now I just want to know why. When you are ready, tell me. Call me, but don't waste my time. I am done with you. The clock is ticking. But Rick, I, I ended the call. My head was spinning. I was so angry. I slouched back into the chair, feeling utterly listless, exhausted, and completely drained. Well, I had ended it with her over the phone, not the ideal way, but who cares? She's caught. I found a small semblance of comfort in the knowledge that so many people now knew about her unfaithfulness. I, unwittingly, played the fool while she betrayed me. It's absurd. 
Pouring myself a generous JD, I sat back down. It had been a taxing day. Glancing at the clock, she had 35 minutes left before the time limit expired. I braced myself. I wasn't sure if she'd spill the beans to her parents, but if I had to do it, I would. I'd send them all the damning evidence I had. I closed my eyes as tears started to fall, a painful cascade down my face as I mourned the loss of a friend of many years. I sat in a daze. The phone interrupted my malaise. I looked at it as it rang, wondering who it could be. Slowly, I got up and ambled unenthusiastically towards the ringing handset. I picked it up as I walked back to my chair. Hello, Rick. It's me. I just had a call from Helen. I'm sorry, son. Really, I am. She's just spun the biggest expletive story I've ever heard. She wanted me to call you to let you know she's told us. I know you have pictures and the rest of it, but I don't need to see that. I understand now what's in the boxes you brought over. Now, look, is there no way you can talk this through? I'm only asking, son. You know, I think a lot of you. I gulped as I tried to formulate an answer. Sobs were building in my throat, and it was hard to hold them back. Look, Dad, you've been great. I'm sorry it has to be this way, but truthfully, I can't see a way around this. It's been going on for too long. Maybe a one-off thing would be different, but this has been regular deceit. I don't think I can do it. I understand, son. Look, we're both here for you. Anytime you need anything, you call me, you hear me? Sure, Dad. I don't know exactly what she told you, so I must send you the email with all the dirt on her. I'm afraid it's up to you, of course, if you open it. But only do so if you have any doubts about her story. I'm sorry. I've got to go. Bye for now. I put the phone down, and the tears exploded from my eyes. Deep, sorrowful sobs echoed around the room. The evening descended, casting shadows across the room. I roused from my chair, absentmindedly placing my phone on charge. A glance at the screen revealed a few missed messages, including one from Georgie Boy. It appeared he had called again not long ago, and from the tone of his messages, it seemed like he was throwing a tantrum. Oh dear me, listen, you nonsense. Helen is with me now so stop being a prick and get used to it. We are going to be nonsense day and night from now on, just like she wants it. And when I can't do her, one of my friends will step in. She has already met Brian, as you know. Tonight, I have visitors coming round. Don't worry, we will keep her satisfied. Night, night, coy. I wasn't sure about Georgie's game, but it seemed like he was out to further humiliate me and use Helen. This situation was escalating, and I doubted Helen was fully aware of his plans. I needed to make her see through this guy, he was a predator, and my marriage was already in shambles because of him. Unsure of what I could or should do, I decided to take a crazy step and called Brian. I had reservations, but Brian and his wife were confirmed swingers, open about their lifestyle. After a brief introduction, I got straight to the point. Hello, you don't know me, but I am Helen's husband. Don't hang up, okay? Listen, pal, we were all consenting adults, okay? It is what we do. If you have a problem, I suggest you see your wife about it. Listen, Brian, my name is Rick. I had no idea what the nonsense was going on until last weekend. Now I am dealing with my wife, but that's not why I called you. I want to know about George. What the nonsense is he up to? I know he used my wife as his swing partner, but what else is he into? Brian responded, Rick, your wife, your problem. I've known George only for a few months, and to be fair, I'm not keen on playing with him anymore. He gets a little too handsy, if you know what I mean. Swapping is one thing, but he's becoming more demanding. Also, we've never used anything like Viagra, but he does. That's what happened at the weekend. He kept going and going, pouted my wife senseless at one point, and he still wanted more. She got worried, and to be honest, so did I. Has he mentioned Group SX to you? I know this is weird, but I need to know. Yes, he did, I admitted. He also talked about gangbangs, but I'm not into that and nor is my wife. We like to play, of course, but that's going too far. I don't know if he mentioned that to Helen. I would be surprised if he did, though, as he only asked me on the side. Said it would be a surprise for the girls if we arranged it. I told him no way, and that's when I decided we were done with him. If you're asking about it, I think something may have happened then. Well, yes, it is, I admit it. But I'm putting two and two together here. Helen and I are together at the moment, but I'm still concerned about her. You split, but we thought you were okay with it all. That's what they both said to us, Brian responded. Oh my, she is. I trailed off. Man, I am sorry. Honestly, we didn't know, Brian offered. Thanks for that, at least. 
but it doesn't help us any. I'm going to try to get hold of Helen before something bad happens, okay? Look, good luck, okay? If there's anything we can do, just ask. I am sorry, man. I put the phone down. It was almost 7 p.m. I called Alfie and briefed him on the latest developments. Within 20 minutes, we were both headed towards George's place. We parked down the road from his house. Did you bring the gear? Alfie asked. Yes, of course I did. What am I, stupid? It's all there, I replied. We scrambled into the back of his truck, changing into boiler suits, balaclavas, bag gloves, and latex gloves. The bag gloves were great for protecting the knuckles. The boots were steel-capped, and the bats were an added incentive, according to Alfie. There was also a bag with spare overalls, gaffer tape, and a hood. I looked at my watch. It was almost 8.30 p.m. Where had the time gone? I hope we were in time. One way or another, whatever was going on was going to stop tonight, maybe permanently. For nonsense's sake, Rick, go easy. Don't lose it, or we face jail. We just need to issue a lesson, okay? No matter what Helen has done, she doesn't deserve to be abused. You clear? Alfie warned. I nodded, adrenaline pumping as I was keen to get this over with. We straightened through the back door. No messing. Bang, bang. Grab the guy and out. Okay, don't forget. Not a nonsense word too. It was dark outside the truck now. We slipped out and silently moved across the road and down the side of George's house. We eased over the back gate and unlocked it, leaving our escape route open. As we neared the back patio doors, we could hear moans and laughter from inside. I froze, nonsense, too late. Alfie poked me with his bat, and we shuffled towards the back door to the kitchen. He leaned on the handle, and it moved easily. He looked at me wide-eyed as he pulled his mask down. I could make out the grin on Alfie's face as we crept through the kitchen towards the light glowing into the hallway from the lounge area. The unmistakable moans from Helen and the chuckles from the men in the room seemed like they were all having fun. We could make out the flash of a camera as they took photos of their actions. That's it. Suck it. Take it down deep. Yes, that's it. A man's voice echoed. We could hear Helen gagging, and then it went quiet as the man encouraged her. She does suck really good, George. You have a real hot one here. It's a shame her hubby couldn't give her what she needed. They all laughed at that. Still, he will get to see the video we're making, and that will pay the bastard back for my car. One of them grunted. Take that, you, expletive. God, her ass is just so sweet and tight. I was getting really agitated now, and Alfie was getting set to pounce. We looked at each other and counted fingers down from three to one. We crashed through the door. That's swinging. Crack. George took one across the back of his neck and stumbled forward, on top of Helen. The guy in her mouth yelled as the shock caused her to bite down on him. Alfie silenced him with a bat round the jaw area. Two down, one to go. We looked around and saw a woman. I raised my bat to deliver a blow to the head when Alfie grabbed it. The two men lay moaning. We returned to them and gave them both a good kicking, and there wasn't much that didn't get clobbered. The woman started screaming. Alfie slapped her hard. Don't hurt me, please don't hurt me, she pleaded. We looked at each other, not knowing what to do. I looked around. Helen was knocked out when the guy had fallen on her. She lay on her back, her legs spread wide and obscenely. There were bite marks all over her chest and neck. It looked like this had been quite a session. Stupid, expletive. As much as I hated her for what she had done, I loved her at the same time. It was confusing. We managed to find out the woman, Joyce, was the wife of the guy with George. We impressed upon her that she had been part of a crime, and as such, we were doing her a favor by not harming her further. Alfie spoke to her, then used gaffer tape to secure and gag her until her lover stirred. They were in no state to move for a while, and even then, only slowly. We collected the cameras and video equipment together and smashed it to bits as Joyce watched. I dressed Helen, who was still out of it, maybe drugged or something. Anyway, she wasn't right. Joyce confirmed they had all used ecstasy, which explained it. We turned off all the lights and left, carrying my wife in the truck. We stripped and bagged all our clothing, tossing it into a bin on the way to Helen's parents' place. She started to come round a little as we fed her water. Pulling up outside her parents' house, I looked around, and Alfie knocked on the door. When the door opened, I slung my wife over my shoulder and pelted for the open door. The look on her mom's face was priceless. I carted her straight upstairs and into her bedroom. I stripped the overalls off her and saw what a mess her body was in. It brought tears to my eyes as I looked at the woman I had loved for so long, now bearing the marks of another man's lust all over her. What, Rick? What is going on? 
her mom asked, following me up the stairs, her father right behind. Helen needs you both right now. I can't explain it all right now, but she has been even more stupid than we thought. Alfie and I have just pulled her out of what could have been a really bad situation, and one that was only going to get worse. She may not thank me, but I do care about her, no matter what she has done. Take care of her. Gotta go, burn these, will you? I handed her the overalls. We closed the door and jumped into the truck. I looked at Alfie. We grinned and high-fived each other. That nonsense ate their evening up somewhat, don't you think? Take me home, James, and don't spare the horses. Final act in the story tale. I lay in bed, listening to the silence interspersed with the regular ticking from the clock on the bedroom wall. I opened my eyes to focus on the clock face. It was just after 9 a.m., and I had slept for almost nine straight hours. That was unusual for me, as I normally operate on around six hours maximum a night. Even then, I can wake with a thick head at times. Today, I lay in my bed, looking around, seeing the empty space where my wife would have been normally. But these weren't normal times. I sighed as I recalled the events of the past few days and beyond. She wasn't here and probably hadn't really been here for some time. And, truth be told, that thought saddened me. The ache in my chest started, and my eyes misted with tears for my loss. The loss of my friend and lover, my life, my marriage, my future too. I sobbed as the tears flowed freely. I could not move as my heart broke, grief overcoming me for several minutes as I mourned my loss. The phone rang, a persistent and annoying ringing breaking into my reverie and interfering with my sorrow. The ringing kept on. Why won't the machine kick in? I thought. Then I roused myself and threw the duvet aside as I swung out of bed and grabbed the handset. Hello. I snarled. Rick, you okay? It's Patty. Sorry, Patty. I didn't mean to snap. I am fine. Really? Well, no, I'm not really. It's all been a bit much to handle. I just feel lost or something. I will be okay. I replied, not really convincing myself. For her, are you up and dressed? If not, get dressed and come on over. We are having a late breakfast. You need to eat and look after yourself now. We can talk about what you want to happen next. So come on, get moving. See you soon. We are expecting you. With that, she put the phone down. I stared at myself in the dressing table mirror. Man, I looked like expletive. I sat, staring at the gaunt face looking back at me before I shook myself out of the fog and went to shower and get dressed. Fifteen minutes later, I grabbed some orange juice from the fridge and gulped it down as I headed out the door. The drive over to my friend's place was strangely relaxing. The window opened, and my radio pounding out a CDC cooled my mood as I drove. I had time to think about the kids. With all the goings on, I had not given either of them much in the way of conscious thought. I would have to do something to contact them both and fast. Ryan was away on a football tour and was due back at the end of next week. But I needed to tell him that things had changed dramatically at this end. But how do I tell him what his mother had been doing? Rachel was another problem. She was on holiday with three of her girlfriends, kicking up their heels before going off to uni. I would have to try her mobile, but there was no telling if I could get through. The thought of spilling the beans on their mother was not something I relished. They were old enough to understand what she had done, but if I couldn't understand why, then what chance did they have? Patty met me at the door, hugged me like a long-lost brother. I needed that. She made me feel like I was human and not a failure as a man. Somehow she looked at me, holding my face so I couldn't avert her eyes. You are a lovely man. Don't you forget it. Just because Helen has messed things up royally, don't think it was your fault or that all women are that way. Put the poor man down, Rick. Come and grab some breakfast. Alfie rolled his eyes at his wife as she stood, her eyes misting up. We sat and ate a hearty breakfast. It was just what I needed after the tension of the past few days. Well, we are still here, mate. No police or anything. So maybe things will stay that way. Let's hope so. Alfie sipped his coffee as he looked at me. Yeah, thanks for everything, mate. I really appreciate it. You too, Patty. I love the pair of you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's enough of all that crap. We need to work out what's next. Well, I still haven't seen Helen's car arrive home yet, so that needs to be sorted. I don't know if I get it towed to her parents' place or just leave it where it is. I don't know how I feel about her at this moment. Patty looked at me and put her hand on mine. Look, Rick, it has been a hell of a few days. Maybe you need to take a breather before you do anything else. The first thing is to make sure that George isn't going to cause any further problems. And... Of course, you will need to talk to the kids and Helen too. After that, are you going to work it out with her, 
or what? Patty, I can't get past what she did. Even after last night, she still went into this willingly and cheated on me with the two of them, and maybe others, for almost six months. I can't forgive that. However much I love her and hate what she did, I couldn't just leave her to be abused, could I? Thing is, Rick, she may well have submitted to that willingly. We don't really know, do we? I stared at her as her words sank in. She was right. Helen may have wanted to be used like that. It was incredulous to me, as she had never shown any signs of wanting that sort of explicit, before. I had no idea. I began to wonder if I knew her at all. I sat and stewed over her words. That is what worries me. If that is the case, then I don't know her at all. And if she has chosen that sort of lifestyle, then I am not a part of it. We are done. I have already started the ball rolling to hit back at her from several directions at once because I can't get past what she has done already without thinking things could get any worse. You are going to have to speak to her sometime, Rick, Alfie chimed in. I don't have to, Alfie. If I need to know anything, I can talk to her parents or go through my solicitor. The wheels are turning there already, as well as the chaos I started amongst her work colleagues and friends. I am trying to decide if her family need to know any more details about what she is like. I did speak to her father, and I sent him the email with all the information, but I don't think he will look at it unless Helen spins him a real sob story. I will leave that for now, but if she pisses me off, they will see exactly what she is. My concern now is the kids. Luckily, they are both away, and I don't see the point in telling Ryan until he gets home next week. Although thinking about it, there is always a chance he could hear something through one of the coaches. I will have to contact him urgently. I think Rachel is backpacking, and I don't expect another call from her until the end of this week. I will email her and get her to contact me at SAP. Want me to call her parents, see how things are, Rick? Patty asked. No, that's okay. I need to do it. I will fill them in on my plans to tell the kids at the same time. I sat in the home office and dialed Helen's parents' number. Her father answered after two rings. Hello, how are things this morning there? Helen is still sleeping, probably a good thing. We will get her cleaned up when she wakes and see what her version of events is. I am sorry, son. Thank you for what you did last night. I hope you don't get into any bother over it, though I don't think that will happen. The guys know I mean business now. The fact that I broke up their little party before it got really started, I hope will warn them off. We will have to wait and see, but there are no police waking me at home this morning, anyway. Will you call by and see Helen soon? I don't think that's a good idea. She started this months ago, and after what she has done over the weekend and since, I am in no mood to take her back. Best to let things lie a while. I've started divorce proceedings. I can't forgive or forget what she has done. She fooled me, and there are guys at the club that were involved and knew. I will not forgive that humiliation. I understand, son, but at least talk to her at some point, her dad said. I replied, I don't think that's a good idea at the moment. Let me know if there is anything I can do or if anything changes, okay? Lastly, I have decided that the kids need to know. We are having a few problems and I don't want them hearing it from someone else. I hope you understand, but it needs to be done. Are you sure about that, Rick? I mean, you may get to work things out and they need never know about this mess. Although I understand why you need to tell them something. Thanks again. Whatever happens, I will tell her you cared enough to try to save her from herself. I put the phone down and sat quietly for a few minutes before Alfie came looking for me. Let's go get Helen's car. I know it's a wreck, but it still drives. It's best not to leave it where it is. I will borrow a low loader, and we can get it covered up and back to your garage. I thought about that, but she started this. Okay, we trashed her car, so why would I now want to make it better? That explicit deserves what she gets, and if that's a little humiliation, then so be it. No nonsense that I am done with her. It can stay where it is for a few days. Alfie backed away and joined Patty in the kitchen. What do you expect? That bitch has ripped his heart and lungs out. Of course, he is angry and wants to lash out at her. She deserves whatever she gets. Patty spun at her husband. Okay, okay, I get it. I was just trying to help, okay? I know, love her. She purred as she hugged him tight. An hour or so later, my phone rang. It was Helen. Alfie and Patty both looked at me wondering what I was going to do. I answered the call. Yes? I am so sorry, Rick. I. I let her words hang in the air, waiting for her to continue. I want to apologize. I realize you know what has been going on. I am so, so sorry, Rick. It was just, well, you know, just sex really. I love you so much. I didn't want to hurt you. 
We didn't mean to hurt you. I just wanted to feel good and enjoy the sex. But my heart is only for you. Stop right there, bitch. My outburst sent shockwaves through the air to her, Alfie, and Patty, who looked at me. First off, you have a strange way of showing you love me. Is that how other guys do that nowadays? Because I sure as hell don't get that. As for not wanting to hurt me, that only works if you don't get caught or don't effing do it in the first place. My patience had worn thin as Helen continued to offer explanations and justifications. Stop, Helen. I don't want to hear any more excuses. You've crossed a line, and there's no going back from this. Her attempts to garner sympathy and shift blame were infuriating. But Rick, I love you. Can we work this out? I promise I'll change. I scoffed at her plea. Change? After all this? I can't trust you anymore. You've shattered any semblance of trust we had. And don't talk about love. Your actions speak louder than words. She shifted to another tactic, trying to evoke pity. But Rick, I have nowhere to go now. My colleagues, the club, everyone knows. I'm ruined. I remained resolute. You should have thought about that before you decided to betray our marriage. I'm not responsible for the consequences of your actions. You made your choices, now you'll have to live with them. Her tone turned to a half-hearted apology. I'm sorry, Rick. I didn't mean for it to go this far. Exhausted from the emotional turmoil, I sighed. Save your apologies, Helen. They won't change anything. I've started divorce proceedings, and I'm moving forward without you. She explained, I was just having fun. Fun? You call that fun? Getting intimate with two other men, letting them film it, and sharing it around like some twisted show and tell? This is beyond messed up, Helen. We were just having fun. Brian and George assured me it was normal in their circle of friends. She tried to downplay the severity of her actions. Normal? Helen, this isn't normal. This is a betrayal of our marriage, our trust. And don't try to shift blame onto Brian and George. You're responsible for your choices. My dad said I should thank you for getting me out of there. But honestly, I knew what was happening, and I agreed to it. We thought it was all in good fun, she continued. Undeterred. You knew? You were aware of what was going on, and you willingly participated? What happened to the woman I thought I knew? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Brian and George said some friends make these videos. It's just a bit of fun, no big deal. She admitted to knowing about the filming, attempting to normalize it. No big deal? Helen, you've not only destroyed our marriage, but you've also jeopardized your reputation, our family, and your own well-being. This is a big deal, and I can't be a part of it, my anger flared. I sat back in my chair, my fist clenched and anger pulsating through me. The weight of betrayal and disbelief hung heavy in the air. I couldn't wrap my head around what Helen had become. The woman I thought I knew was now a stranger, and the revelation of her willing participation in such debauchery left me dumbfounded. As I raged against her, slamming the phone down, I felt an uncontrollable surge of fury. The notion that she was not only involved but seemingly enthusiastic about the whole affair was incomprehensible. I wanted to strangle her to make her feel the pain she had inflicted on me. I couldn't speak to her anymore. The person on the other end of the line was not the woman I married. She had become something else entirely. Before ending the call, I decided to send her a copy of the text message George had sent me. Let her see the extent of her betrayal from her so-called buddy. As I fired up my laptop, my thoughts were a chaotic mix of anger, betrayal, and hurt. The email to my children was brief but urgent. They needed to know, and I needed to hear their voices. I hoped they would understand the gravity of the situation, even if I struggled to comprehend it myself. I sat back, my fists balled tightly, staring into space as my mind churned with visions of my once faithful wife, now replaced by a wanton figure, the star in a debauched spectacle. How had this happened? What had I done to cause it? Why hadn't I seen it before? These questions echoed in my mind, each one intensifying the confusion and pain. Any lingering doubt about where I stood with Helen had evaporated. It was evident that whatever had driven her to this behavior had obliterated any love we once shared. The actions I had taken so far were driven by revenge, anger, and a genuine sense of betrayal. Now, there seemed to be no way forward but to end it completely. Talking to the kids was inevitable, but the prospect felt daunting. I wanted to explain, to help them understand, but how could I? I contemplated the possibility of divorce, but questions would arise regardless. I needed to be prepared for that. Turning to Alfie, I asked about the memory cards from the cameras. His fearful expression told me he understood the wildness in my eyes. He confirmed having them and pointed to the desk drawer in front of me. Accepting that there was no way to salvage what was lost, I made up my mind. 
I would copy the videos and send them to my solicitor and anyone else I could think of. There was no turning back. The couple, Alfie and Patty, exchanged glances, realizing they were witnessing the final throes of a crumbling marriage. It had been traumatic thus far, but now Rick seemed to have gone over the top, spiraling out of control as he approached the exit of his marriage to Helen. Taking the memory cards, he swiftly downloaded the videos and photographs onto his laptop, making copies in a matter of minutes. Alfie and Patty sat in their kitchen, sipping coffee, listening to the rhythmic tapping of the keyboard. I think he's really done, don't you? Patty said, looking at her husband. Yeah, afraid so. It's been a hell of a ride this past week. I would never have believed it could happen to those two, but here we are. Just goes to show, you don't really know people, Alfie replied. Almost twenty minutes later, Rick emerged at the door, looking utterly worn out. His eyes were reddened and misty, and he appeared physically drained, like a mere shell of the man they once knew. I've sent copies of everything to my solicitor and asked him to push the divorce as fast as he can. I've taken all the money from all of the accounts and transferred it to one in my name only. Screw her. I also sent all her friends the videos, too. Spiteful, I know, but why should I be the only one with those images in my head? I'm past caring now. I need the kids to get in touch ASAP so I can tell them what to expect when they return. That's my only concern now. I am done with that, Rick explained. They watched as Rick collapsed to his knees, the emotions he had kept in check for the past week now released as he couldn't fight them off any longer. Tears rolled down his cheeks as he sobbed deeply and loudly, mourning his marriage. Patty rushed to him, wrapping her arms around him, while Alfie felt tears fall from his eyes as his friend disintegrated in front of them. Two days later, Rick put the phone down after speaking to his daughter. His face transitioned from tears that fell as he explained in the barest detail what his mother had done. Rachel was sobbing too but stoic in her support for her dad. He was her hero. She was behind him all the way, even though she didn't understand all of what her mother had done. She knew if she had upset her dad, that was all the reason she needed. The call with Ryan was different. He was defensive of his mother but realized he was fighting an uphill battle as his father remained firm on his intent to divorce. Rick was saddened but, in some way, relieved as he sat back, with the sounds of his children's words in his ears. Are you sure, Dad? That kept ringing over and over as he stared out across the patio at the looming twilight. Damn right I am sure, he said aloud as he bolted the last of his JD down. Deciding he had had enough for one day, he stood and wandered over to the phone. He plugged the cord back in, pressing the answering machine. He heard he had 37 messages, he had only turned it off this morning, he thought. Rick pressed play, and the messages started. Rick, it's me. Delete. Rick, delete this. This went on until he heard one from Patty. Rick, we know you want to be alone, but just call us. Let us know you're okay. Hang in there, big guy. He smiled and deleted more from Helen. He had no intention of speaking to her at all. It was just too painful. Helen's father. Rick, it's me. How are you doing? Just call. Let me know you're okay. Helen was served with the papers today. I also know there are several videos circulating. Son, I am sorry you did that, but I can understand your hurt. Just let me know you are okay. He deleted. As he deleted the last message, the phone rang to life, startling him, as he had been on autopilot for the last few minutes. He picked up the receiver, saying nothing. Rick, are you there? Please don't hang up. I know it's too late, but we need to talk. Talk to what? I had a man serve me with divorce papers today at my parents' house. We can talk about this. What about the kids? We can get past this. Talk to me. Silence. I know you're there, Rick. Talk. Say something. Nothing. Rick stood in the dim light of the home he had shared with her, listening to the last throes of his life with her as she struggled to hang on to him. There is no money in the account, Rick. What have you done? There are things we need to talk about. Damn it. Talk to me. He listened as she started to sob. He smiled. She was losing control. Rick. I'm sorry. I messed it up. I don't know why. It was just exciting and naughty and seedy too. It was just sex. I couldn't help it. George took advantage of me. I know he did, but I don't understand how. Silence. She knew he was listening as she started to be honest for the first time. He could hear that too. Maybe we could she thought for a millisecond. Rick, the videos. Why did you send the videos? Everyone knows about them now. They all think I am a whore, she sobbed hoping to hear his voice telling her it will be okay. But there was nothing. Did you have to post them on the internet, though? Her sobbing grew deeper and uncontrolled. 
For a few seconds, he stood in passivity as he listened to his soon-to-be ex-wife pouring her heart out. Rick, is there nothing I can say or do to stop this and get back to where we were? Please, Rick, answer me. Talk to me. If you love me at all, please talk to me. Her words floated through his mind as he wiped the tears from his face. His heartache made him feel dizzy as he knew this was the end game approaching. He knew he could never take her back. He had promised himself to her and no other. He had kept his part of the bargain, but she chose to throw him away for some sleazy encounter in a Blackpool hotel. Though there was no way back, he and the kids would be fine eventually and move on. He knew it would be hard, but that's life. No, was all he said as he put the receiver down and turned the ringer off. He turned and wearily climbed the stairs to his bedroom, now solely his, not theirs. He laid on the bed and let the tears flow again. It was over. Dear listener, if you have reached this far please click on the subscribe button. It will be a great help.